Hello everyone and welcome to Hill Street. Today's story is... Night 1. Simon. If you end up enjoying this story, please leave a like. And if you enjoy hearing stories from me, please subscribe and become a resident of Hill Street and let me know how I'm doing in the comments. And I just want to say thank you to all of the residents. Today is my 100th video. It has been an amazing journey and thank you all for listening. It really means a lot to me and I really enjoy doing all of this for you. I'm glad that everyone is enjoying the content and enjoying these stories. All of the residents at Hill Street are amazing. You all are the greatest, I swear. We have grown so much in the past few months and I am super grateful for it. Here's to another hundred videos. Now, let's get to this nightmare. The first time felt weird, really weird. It took me back to my first and only AA meeting. Crappy coffee, stale biscuits, an awkward, asymmetrical circle of strangers. We sat in silence, twelve of us. It was drawing out over the seconds, quieter and quieter. I found my fingers teasing around the warm styrofoam. Bang! The hall door crashed open suddenly, cutting through the mild tension. Is this the dream thing? This messy girl stood at the entrance of the hall, staring at us with as much bewilderment as we stared back with. We must have looked like a sad bunch in our warped circle, but she was enough to break the silence. I was relieved. Yeah, well, we think so. Nobody's turned up yet that works for the thing. It was an older guy who had responded. He looked down at his phone. Ten minutes late now. Does anyone else think this is an elaborate prank? pretty damn elaborate if so, to make us all see the same thing in our dreams. Does anyone mind if I have a cigarette? The messy girl slowly approached with a chair. There was a wave of shrugs in response as she pulled out her lighter. She spoke again, post-drag. So, how many times did you see the ad in your dreams before you actually made the phone call? The older guy spoke again. Are you the one running the show? Paranoid, aren't you? She said. The old man spoke again. I'm just not a fan of games, especially ones that waste my time. Another drag. Then she spoke again. Then why'd you call the number? Silence. Then the old man said. Because I'd figured it'd make the ad stop. Hmm, and that didn't quite work out, I'm guessing. He shook his head. Messy girl nodded and looked around the circle, sighing. We all fell back into the silence. The styrofoam wasn't warm anymore. Okay, I'm gonna start since we're here for the same reason. I'm not gonna act like this is an odd, and I don't want to talk about it with people who are seeing this crap too. I don't know who we're supposed to be waiting for, but it would be nice to hear from other people. Right? Right. She had her attention. Cool. Well, I think I first noticed the dream a year ago. I was scrolling through Instagram stories, and it popped up as a sponsored post. Just a basic pink background, with white text that said, If you're seeing this ad in your dreams, contact this number and of course I woke up and didn't remember the number at all we all had similar experiences as we went around the room and people shared their dreams it was more or less the same story we all ignored it at first it's a dream after all but by around the fifth and tenth time we encountered the ad in our dreams we started to recall the contact details. We all remember slight variations of the organization's name. Milton Dream Council. 
Milton Sleep Hypnosis Therapy Board, Milton Sleep Clinic, always Milton though. The older guy, Baz, a 45 year old Greek guy, had been seeing the ad the longest, almost three years. It took him two years to call the number, even though he'd remembered it from the first dream. Look, I grew up around superstitious gypsies, but screw me if I ever buy into this kind of crap. But two years was my limit. I caved and called the number. I'm not spooked. I'm just annoyed. So wait, you called the number a year ago then? The redhead sitting next to me spoke up. Yeah, gave me this date and address a year ago. Bloody elaborate, right? Damn yeah, I called last week. What followed was a comparison of dates we'd call. We'd all made the call at very different times over the past year, and we were told by a man's voice to meet at this community hall at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, the 20th of November. The man had answered the phone and stated the different organization names that seemed to be custom to each of us. We also compared the numbers in our phone logs. It seemed we all remembered and dialed a different number, yet all ended up here in this community hall at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, November 20th. By the time we'd shared these realizations, it was nearing 8 p.m., and still nobody had shown up. So, the redhead next to me spoke again. Do we just call it? I mean, nobody here has the answers, and nobody's coming to answer them by now, surely. Once again, I noticed how tightly I was gripping the styrofoam cup in my hands. The sides had cracked. The tension that surrounded us when we first sat in these seats was replaced by something else. Baz stood up, huffing. Agreed. I'm done here. Nice to know I'm not the only one. I can plead sanity to my wife now. Cheers. Bang. A flinch ran through all of us as we immediately looked to the front door again, like spooked deer hearing a twig snap. Thank you all for waiting. I'm glad to see you have all made it. There was no doubt. This was the same man's voice who had told us to meet here, except there was this crackly, faded quality to his voice almost as if we were still hearing him through the phone. A little too tall, a little too thin. He wore a black cap and circular spectacles that sat on his bony nose and cheeks, shielding these eyes of, I can't describe what I saw in them. I briefly glimpsed around the room and noticed that nobody else seemed to be gazing directly at him. He made the room thick with unease. Nobody spoke. Baz sat down. My name is Simon. Again, thank you all for attending. Simon walked a little too slow to grab a stacked chair and join the circle. My stomach was telling me to move, to leave. I sat fixed to my seat, listening to the slow echoing drag of the plastic against linoleum. I felt suspended in the sound, as if it would never end. I urged myself to look anywhere but at him. I stared into my cracked cup, but the undeniable shake of my hands forced me to find a new focal point. Again, I looked around the circle. How was everyone so calm, so still, barely blinking? Riley. My eyes darted back to Simon. He sat directly opposite me. Oh God, those eyes. Why did they upset me so much? Uh, yes? You notice it, don't you? Ooh, the breeze. They weren't calm or still. 
Everyone else sat frozen, suspended in time. I turned to look again with purpose this time, as if Simon had given me permission to look. It wasn't right. I wasn't meant to see this. People frozen in time may as well be dead people. I turned back to Simon. My body felt heavy, like gravity had intensified. Don't be afraid. Um, I was terrified. The side of Simon's mouth creased into a grin over the span of ten very long seconds. I wanted him to stop smiling. I wanted it all to stop. I couldn't make sense of anything that was happening. He straightened up, his long white fingers reaching up to his cap. You're doing well. His mouth wasn't moving. I stared back down to my styrofoam cup. Did you drug me? No. Still smiling. Riley, I need to show you something. I could hear the blood in my ears, in my head. My lungs struggled to heave. He began lifting the cap off his head. Tinnitus stung through me. I wanted to run away, to cry, to scream. Simon smiled back at me, still pulling slowly at the cap. The tinnitus screamed louder. My vision warped and tugged at the edges. The stale community hall suddenly surrounded me with harsh fluorescent light. I thought I was going to die in this place. The tinnitus became all too human. A wailing scream inside my head. Was it me? Was I screaming like that? I have never heard a person make a noise like that before. Simon's eyes had me in a death grip. His smile growing with my warping vision. He was too gray. Too gray. The wailing intensified as his long fingers gripped the cap, right on the crown of his head. His eyes widen, alongside his already too wide smile, and the wailing continued, the lights burning my eyes, causing hot tears in the corners. Simon, this non-human thing, staring directly at me, tugged slowly at the cap. Bang! I woke up, in my bed, and immediately threw up, gasping for air, as if I'd just emerged from underwater. I wept, shaking, covered in sweat. I checked my phone. 7 AM, Friday, November 21st.